Welcome to the Science for the Public lecture series. Science for the Public is an organization committed to bringing science information and issues to the general public. Visit our website for our program listings and blog. Welcome to Contemporary Science Issues and Innovations. Today we learn about this especially exciting year at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. The particle collisions this year have been produced at the highest energy ever, and there is a great sense of anticipation as the LHC scientists analyze the data. Our guest is Dr. Tulika Bose, Associate Professor of Physics at Boston University and a member of the international team of scientists making scientific history at the LHC. Dr. Bose was the trigger coordinator of the uh, compact muon solenoid CMS experiment from 2014 to 2016, and she now heads up a CMS physics group that searches for new physics, one of the major goals of the Large Hadron Collider. We'll learn what that entails today. Dr. Bose is our excellent source of information about the discoveries at the Large Hadron Collider and the search for new physics there. You can view her two previous programs for Science for the Public on our website. Today, she explains this year's experiments at the LHC. Tulika Bose received her PhD in experimental high energy physics from Columbia University in 2006, and she followed that with postdoctoral research at Brown University and specialized research at the Fermilab Tevatron and at the Compact Muon Solenoid CMS experiment at the CERN Large Hadron Collider. She joined the physics department at Boston University in 2008. Dr. Bose has published widely and has received a number of awards. She's a nonstop scientist, but despite her hectic schedule, she makes herself available to explain the work of the LHC to the general public. We are honored and very grateful for her willingness to visit us today. Thank you, Dr. Bose, and welcome. Thank you very much, Yvonne. And I would like to know if you give us some background on particle physics, what it is you do in the first place. What is meant by that? What we're trying to do at the Large Hadron Collider is uh, study elementary particles and their interactions. Now, if you wanted to really understand material, for example, your wristwatch or your computer, what you do is you get a screwdriver, you open mm -hmm. it up and you see. Now the challenge with elementary particles is that there is no simple tool that allows you to probe what it is made of mm -hmm. and how it interacts. So what we do instead is get elementary particles, collide them and see what happens in the resulting debris. And what you can further do is put in more and more energy. So the yeah. more energy you put into the collision, the heavier the mass you may be able to create in the, in the resulting debris. And what we are trying to do at the LHC is put in lots and lots of energy, such that using Einstein's e equals mc square, we're right. able to produce heavy new masses, new particles that we can study. When you do that, does that take you back to the beginning of matter, of baryonic matter, does that, uh, what do I want to say, resurrect it somehow, the beginning of it? Yes, it, what we are trying to do is essentially recreate the conditions right after the Big Bang, the, the universe was born, by, by creating conditions mm. which are similar in our laboratory. Okay, so, and so you have to have huge energies to accomplish that. There is another thing there. I understand, and maybe not well, that cosmic rays do this. As they hit the surface of the Earth, that they produce extremely high energy collisions there. Is that correct? Is that what you're trying to do, and is there? 
It's similar in the sense that cosmic ray particles are very high energetic. Mm -hmm. What we are trying to do in our laboratory is accelerate certain particles to these very high energies. Okay. And then the, the more energy you put into the collision, you can create more possibilities. Okay. I mean, as an example, imagine you have two baseballs and you're trying to make them collide. Yes. If they just have a simple glancing collision, nothing really right. happens. Right. But as you start putting in more and more energy, you can now get to the point where you break up the two baseballs and you can start to see what is inside. What's inside. So, so you do this. Another thing, when you send these particles whirling around in the LHC to collide, do you select a particular particle to do that? Is there a particular ion or something? That's right. So there are certain particles that are more suited for this uh. for a variety of reasons. What we use at the LHC are hadrons. These are heavy particles which are actually not elementary. They are composite in the sense that they are made of constituent particles. So the hadron, our favorite hadron at the LHC is the proton. Uh -huh. So the proton is composed of certain further elementary particles that are called quarks. Yes. So three quarks make up a proton. And so what we're trying to do is collide a bunch of protons with another bunch of protons, hoping that in this resulting interaction, you have quarks interacting and you can come to see what happens as a result of this interaction. Okay. So you do this collision, you are selective about what you collide, then you have to gather an enormous amount of data. Could you please tell us like how much, how many collisions, is that the way to say it, you would get in a very short time? So collisions at the LHC, that means uh, a bunch of protons colliding with another bunch, uh, is ha they're happening about every 25 nanoseconds. Oh my goodness. So that's a rate of about 40 <laughs> megahertz, or 40 million times a second. Naturally, we cannot be recording data at this rate. Yeah. Uh, real world limitations in terms of how much money we have, yeah. how much we can analyze, and what period of time, all determine how much we can write out. And that is about a thousand hertz or a thousand events per second. So you wow. have to go from this input rate of 40 megahertz to a thousand hertz. And is this where the trigger comes right. in? Could you tell us about that? I think in one of the other programs you did, but if you could refresh our memories because you were very much involved in that. So the, taking this input rate of 40 megahertz, one needs to come down to a rate that we can write out, 1,000 hertz. The way we do this is by designing criteria, sort of filtering criteria or selection criteria, which allow us to select events which are interesting enough to keep. So we are literally triggering on certain events yeah. and deciding, yes, it's good, let me keep it, no, throw it away. You do that using uh, different technology. At the first level, we have electronics, which essentially run simple algorithms where you make selections such as, do I have an electron in this event? Or uh -huh. do I have a muon in this event? Does it have momentum or energy above a certain threshold? So using very simple criteria, you're able to bring this input rate of 40 megahertz down to a more manageable 100 kilohertz. And then you have a farm of CPUs that runs C++ algorithms. Uh -huh. and, and using these algorithms, you can make sort of more complicated decisions requiring multiple criteria to choose or to decide whether or not to keep that event or not and bring it down further to a thousand hertz. I see. So all of this has to be carefully set up in advance. And I imagine that was a bit um, scary <laughs> this last time because you're you were doing it at an energy that is simply unprecedented right. so uh, that must have been um, challenging it was very very challenging uh, because the first thing is that every decision we take firstly is happening in real time 
we cannot afford to make a wrong decision yeah. because if we are potentially throwing away some of these new physics particles, yeah. there's no going back because whatever we reject is really gone for good. There I is see. no going back. I see. So it was a huge deal, a big responsibility to be you know, ensuring yeah. that whatever we were writing out could potentially keep our new physics and whatever we were throwing away was really not that particularly interesting. I see. So careful planning up ahead there and hoping that <laughs> this will work all right. And apparently it did, as apparently it was amazing. There are a couple things here. Um, how, when you first you, you get that data, it must be saved somewhere. That's a lot of data, isn't it? Is it is it hard to kind of preserve that? I mean, where do you put it? <laughs> That's an excellent question. It requires a lot of computing resources. Uh -huh. And in fact, that was a challenge this year uh, in the sense that the LHC did so well and produced so much data that the experiments really had to keep up with you know, being able to keep it. So it requires resources which we get from centrally all our collaborators over the world. Uh, the US is a big part of it, and, and this is stored in, in disks, in tape, all over the world. Okay, then you get the data, and I'm thinking back to the time of the Higgs, and they thought there was a possibility, but they were super cautious about announcing anything until they could really verify it. In, in, at this time, you have this enormous amount of data. How long does it take to sort of wade through that, especially when you're looking for new things? Huh? So we continue to analyze it. So in principle, for some of the, the known things, we can come up with results very quickly uh -huh. of the order of a month or two months. I see. However, the challenge would be if we see something surprising then of course it needs to go through a very, very strict control and to make sure that the results that we come out with are you know, vetted by everybody in the collaboration, for I example. See. Uh, but it is a challenge keeping up with it, but then we have large collaborations and the yeah. work is split up such that we can do this quite quickly. Right. Uh, you know, you have these different experiments, like you're the CMU, I think there is Atlas Alice, uh, a bunch of them mm -hmm. evidently. Uh, they're separate experiments, but they complement each other. Is that correct? So that you were able, was that used to verify the Higgs, for instance? Would that be used uh, when you're looking for something new and you get a blip and you? It, does it show up in multiple experiments? Absolutely, ah. that's, that's a very important uh, aspect actually. I mean, I, I like using an analogy. Say you're you know, traveling in a car with a friend and you see a strange Yeti-like character around. <laughs> what is your first reaction? You turn around to your friend and say, did you see that? Now, if your friend also saw it, then you can have confidence that you saw something strange. Yes. But if your friend didn't, then you would question yourself. You yes. know, did you imagine it? So the role of the experiments at the LHC is exactly that, I especially see. CMS and ATLAS, which are sort of what we call general purpose experiments going after a wide variety of particle physics. And if one experiment were to see something interesting, we would really expect that the other experiment should also see it. I mean, yes. There could be small caveats that maybe, you know, maybe at not at the same level, et cetera. Right. But in general, both CMS and ATLAS are very complementary to each other, okay. using different technology to go after the same physics. And so we should really expect both of them to see it, which gives everybody confidence then right. in the result in the end. Right. I think that's a clever thing. In the design, it's reassuring because there are so many mysteries in this, and you've gone after things you you have no clue what it is you're going to find, which is great fun, but a little nerve wracking, I imagine too. Okay, um, I, before we move on to a few other things in this about what you're looking for, would you say are there any just real fundamental things we should know about? how the collider works and what it's supposed to do, what we're supposed to find. 
The, the collider is uh, now running at sort of record energy. Yeah. And, and what we are hoping is we'll recreate these conditions after the Big Bang and, and discover new particles as a result of these collisions, which will allow us to sort of answer some of the big questions that still face particle physics. Uh -huh. We know that now that we have discovered the Higgs boson, we have an understanding of how elementary particles get their mass. However, yeah. we do not fully know if the Higgs boson that we discovered was the boson that was predicted by the so-called standard model of particle physics, yes. or if it is a cousin or a brother of the Higgs boson that we expected. Okay. And what we want to be able to do in the, in the data we're going to collect is to be able to say conclusively that indeed it is the standard model Higgs boson. Then there are other questions. While the X boson helps us understand how elementary particles get their mass, it doesn't explain the, the matter-antimatter asymmetry in the universe. Ah, I see. It doesn't explain the fact that the, visible, the, the particles that we know comprise only a very small portion yeah. of the universe. Just about 5% of yeah. the universe is composed of uh, one of these particles, so-called the visible part. The rest of it, we don't know much about yet. And this is the baryonic matter? Uh, that, that it, that's the 5% that you know about. A couple of things on that. Uh, can the LHC confirm definitely or raise questions about the Big Bang itself, whether that was uh, definitely happened, instead of, we keep going back and forth on this in physics uh, about uh, whether the universe just expands and then collapses again, expands and collapses. And uh, so, so would that confirm it, your experiments there? Confirm. I think the, the big uh, question related to this is the, uh, the matter-antimatter asymmetry. Now, uh -huh. at the time of the Big Bang, we expect that these were created in equal amounts. And if so, there should have been annihilation and, 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 everything, and, and would disappear. everything would disappear. <laughs> However, you and I exist mm -hmm. and we are made of matter. So where has the antimatter gone? Yes. And, and so this question, or trying to understand the answer to this question, really takes us back to the Big Bang. Okay. And whether or not things happened the way we think they did. Okay. And so what the experiments at the LHC are trying to do is come up with ways in which we can explain this matter-antimatter asymmetry in the universe. Right. So that is a clear expectation. You expect to be able to do that. Have you come up with any answers on that? Yeah, that's such an exciting one. <laughs> no, this research is ongoing, and we expect that the data that CMS Atlas, as well as our uh, uh, LHCB experiment, yeah. which actually focuses a lot of its research on understanding exactly ah, this question, I the matter-antimatter asymmetry, right. will be able to address. So that it, it's a possibility to explain that then. I mean, they won't have to look forever and ever. I was thinking because of the high energy collisions that is expected to present some answers this time on that. Right. I mean, it's just that the conditions you're able to create give you the ability to sort of look more precisely and answer some of these questions which require very precision measurements at high energy. Okay. And the experiments, the current experiments are designed to be able to answer some of these questions. Okay. I want to backtrack for just a minute here too and uh, ask about the Higgs and mass. I think it is a difficult thing to understand like what is mass anyway, but that it has to come from something. And that was, I thought, one of the big questions, which was why everybody was excited about the Higgs particle. Could, could you give us a little information about that? Okay. So within the standard model, uh, the idea is that there exists a, a field called the Higgs field. And the interaction with this Higgs field is what determines a particle's mass. Okay. Now, this is very esoteric. Right. So let's think of an analogy. And an analogy could be that imagine that there is a, a room full of people who are partying, talking to each other. Right. And a very famous person is uh, on the other side of the room who is just about to enter the room. 
So as a famous person comes in, everybody starts going around this person to try and talk to the person. So the movement of the person in, in going through from one end of the room to the other is sort of impeded. They are slowed down because everybody is stopping them, wanting to talk to them. So they're interacting with this group of people. Yeah. And the more they interact, the more they are slowed down. This is similar to how we think of it in physics, that the larger the interaction, greater the mass, because the particle now is moving more and more slowly. Okay. And, and so the, if a particle, on the other hand, were to come in and not interact at all, then it would be like it's like massless. So if a complete nobody, on the other hand, comes into this room full of people, then that person can really whiz from one end of the room to the other without in any interactions and, and, and have almost seemed like they have no mass. Okay. It's a, there is another analogy. Imagine uh, you're up in the air on the sky and uh, you have a parachute and you're going to get off a plane and come falling onto the earth. What would you rather have, a fully opened parachute mm -hmm. or a parachute that is closed? You want a parachute that is fully open because a fully opened parachute is going to interact more with the air. Uh -huh. And as it interacts more with the air, your movement through the air is slowed down and you arrive safely and soundly. On the other hand, if you had a parachute that does not open up, and is therefore not interacting much with the air, you're going to quickly fall, and that wouldn't be fun. Okay. While you're on that, uh, could you just tell us briefly, like, what these categories are there, things that... Okay. So, yes, this picture nicely depicts what's called the standard model of particle physics. Uh, it's sort of broken down into uh, what are called uh, fermions and gauge bosons. Uh, fermions, they follow Fermi statistics, uh -huh. and that's where the term comes from. And uh, here you have two groups. One is, let's start with what are called the light particles, mm -hmm. or leptons, that's mm -hmm. uh, where the word comes from. They are grouped into what are called three generations. One, two, three, mm -hmm. that's the number you see the electron, the muon, and the tau. Okay. These are charged particles, and they have what I call corresponding neutral particle. So you have your electron neutrino, your muon neutrino, and your tau neutrino. There are also other elementary particles called quarks. These are what you see on the very top, and they have interesting names. Physicists yes, they uh, do. <laughs> uh, like to give such names. Yes. Up, down, <laughs> strain, charm, top and bottom. Very top and clever. Bottom. <laughs> yes. We're also at one point called truth and beauty. <laughs> oh, yeah. And uh, so they comprise, uh, or they are called quarks. Now, all the um, uh, atoms and molecules that we know of are composed of what are called hadrons such as a proton and mm -hmm. a neutron, mm -hmm. which make up, say, hydrogen. Mm -hmm. The proton consists of three quarks. It consists of two up quarks and a down quark, okay. for example. So these are elementary particles, these quarks, which have fractional charge, yeah. which comprise, for example, a hadron such as a proton or a neutron, okay. which then comprises uh, hydrogen and helium and, and so on and so okay. forth. Uh, in addition to that, uh, within uh, particle physics and within physics in general, we have uh, the known sort of forces. There is the, uh, what's called the electromagnetic force, which is responsible for electricity and magnetism. And, and we say that the interaction of the force or how the force interacts or how it is mediated is done by this uh, particle called the photon. Uh, there's also the, the strong force, which is responsible for keeping uh, nuclei together. And that is mediated by this particle called the gluon. Okay. Then there is the weak force, which is responsible for beta decay, mm -hmm, for mm -hmm. radioactivity. And that is mediated by these particles are called the W and Z boson, which are responsible for how this interaction happens. So these comprise what are called the uh, bosons, the gauge bosons, responsible for these fundamental forces. Um, now, uh, within the standard model, 
uh, all of this was fine. However, we didn't really know why these particles had the mass that they had, uh -huh. for example. Uh, within the symmetry of the standard model, it was assumed that everything would be fine if, for example, all of these uh, gauge bosons were massless. Mm -hmm. But then, theory told us, as well as experimental data told us, that the W and Z, for example, were not massless, but they actually had mass. So it predicted, yes. the theory predicted the, that yes. they would, they would have it. mass. And then in the 80s, these particles were actually discovered. Mm -hmm. And indeed, mm -hmm. they had mass. Mm -hmm. And for all of this to fit in, theorists came up with this idea that there was this particle called the Higgs boson, which was part of this, this was what was, would be responsible for the Higgs field. Okay. And the Higgs field is what is responsible for giving particles mass. Okay. So that's where the Higgs uh, comes into this picture. Okay. And just one more quick thing there, a field, any field is like, is, is it just dispersed all it's, over yeah, it's the... It's an all-pervasive okay. all right. Uh, it's field. not a line right. or anything like that, attached from here to there no. or anything. I mean, related to this, and actually a big question that we are trying to understand mm -hmm. and address, is that there is another fundamental force that is actually not shown here in this picture. Uh, and that is the force that we deal with in our everyday lives, the force of gravity. Gravity that nobody understands. <laughs> so gravity is what keeps us, you yeah. know, supplanted on this earth, and it's a fundamental force, and in principle it should be part of this picture mm -hmm, within mm -hmm. the standard model. However, our current understanding is we don't quite know or understand how it fits in. So what we are trying to do, and this is an important question that we are trying to understand and address at the LHC, is how gravity fits into this. Can we come up and understand a theory which includes this gravitational force together with these other forces? There is, for example, a particle called the graviton, yeah. which in many theories is responsible for the gravitational force. Right. That's so, that's a theoretical that's particle a, yes, at the moment, like the Higgs a, exactly. was. Exactly. So thing. you know, I mean, so five hoping. years ago, yes. Well, the Higgs was right, right now. It's the graviton. Right. So what we are trying to do at the LHC is in look in different, many different ways, right. because we don't quite know what uh, or how the graviton might manifest itself in right. our data. Right. So we are looking in many different ways, trying to see if we can, in fact, discover the graviton. And if we do, then that would really solidify theories which are predicting the graviton to behave in a certain way. Yeah, it's impressive that theory works so well, especially for this that is so difficult, so abstract, but it seems to every time, it, it, it comes around like that. It must be very exciting. Well, it is. I mean, the, it's really amazing to see how all of the predictions of the standard yeah. model have really been uh, true, yeah, you know, right. and, and been tested by all of the experiments to amazing precision. However, what we do know is that because of all of these questions, the matter-antimatter asymmetry, yes. the question of gravity, yeah. that the picture that we know, the standard model, is incomplete. Yes. It is a very good theory and however it is likely needs to be extended yeah. by ah. something which will then give it, us the theory yeah, of everything. Right, right. But it's amazing that you can get the theory of everything. And I ask you about dark matter or do you expect to find uh, answers about that? Yes. At the L we know that the particles that we understand constitute only about 5% mm -hmm, of the universe. Mm -hmm. A large fraction of it is what's called dark, mm -hmm. meaning we can't really see it, but we can only infer its presence through its gravitational interactions. Mm -hmm. This is the so-called dark matter. Yes. Now, within uh, physics, we have a lot of theories which predict different particles that could be responsible for dark matter. Uh -huh. And what we are trying to explore at the LHC and look for are some of these particles which could really explain what is responsible for dark matter. Uh, so it's it's not necessary that they're so elusive that you can't 
get capture. No, them. indeed, no. You do expect this to capture. Oh, a big focus of what we are trying to do in the next few years. Yeah. Now that we found the Higgs, a lot yes. of focus has shifted to dark matter. I see. We want to find the particle that's responsible for dark matter. Right. And it, I'm, this is a naive question. It's assumed that it is a particle, not something completely different since we're based on particles in baryonic matter. So I think most of the theories that's what they predict, that okay. there is a particle. However, the nature of the particle is unknown and there are a range of theories. And so we have actually complementary experiments, not just at the LHC, but elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Those who are mm -hmm. looking in different ways mm -hmm. to figure out mm -hmm. what dark matter is. I see. Is there anything else that you are looking for that we have missed. Yes. So I mean so we there are certain known things like graviton, dark matter. Right. However, we really don't know what the new physics is. Right. And we have to be prepared for the unexpected. Right. That means while doing very exclusive searches looking for particles with certain properties, we need to keep an open mind mm -hmm. because what if the new physics manifests itself in a way that nobody ever imagined. So what it's a an challenge. interesting thing. So the data that you presently have and before you start up again, I guess, are the, is, is it enough, do you think, you will be able to come up with some of this new physics? Are you anticipating that? We are hopeful. Uh, mm -hmm. We're now running at this, you know, record energy. We have collected a large amount of data this year. We're going to continue taking data in the next mm -hmm. few years, uh -huh. collecting even more data. Yes. So we really hope that the data that we collect will be able to help us discover something or at least point us in the direction of where to go next. Right. The LHC, is it expected to run up for decades yet, a couple of decades, to, so it's going to be That's busy right. for it's, a while. It's, we're going to be taking data for a long period of time with the current detectors up until yeah. like the mid uh, 2020s. I see. We're going to go into then uh, an upgrade whereby we're going to improve and upgrade our detectors and this will happen in the mid 2020s and then we continue taking data for another 10, 15 years after that. I see. This is going to keep you busy for a lifetime, isn't <laughs> yes. it? But what an exciting time because it is for you know, forever people had to try to do things on the back of an envelope to figure out these forces and so on and this is amazing that you can go and find it now confirm it um, are, do you have any special project yourself in mind well, my, well my pro one of my projects is exactly looking for uh, some of these new particles mm -hmm. that could be uh, the answer to some of these questions and I'm looking for a particle that's called a top partner. The top, top quark partner? Yes. The, the top quark that we looked at yes. uh, in the yes. standard model, uh, theories predict that it could, there could be an exotic version uh -huh. of the top quark, which we call the top quark partner. So what I'm trying to do in the data is, is look for one of these top quark partners that might be able to explain and help answer some of the questions. Aha. Uh -huh. So you, you keep <laughs> like uh, delineating these, these things. Uh, they get uh, more elaborate all the time and you keep finding new particles or looking for new particles to answer, really give you a full picture of matter as, as it is. I wish you lots of luck with this. It is most exciting. I know that you are running back and forth to CERN all the time. And uh, I really appreciate your coming in and giving us an update as you have done before. And uh, thank you ever so much. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure talking to you.